Let's begin with a welcome to Marta Sands, author of Small Red Women. Hola, Marta. Bienvenida. Gracias por participar hoy en esta lectura bilingüe de tu novela. Hola, Katie. Muchas gracias por haberme, por haberme invitado. Soy, soy, te estoy muy contenta porque, por tu generosidad y por tu hospitalidad. Ah, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you to say. Um, so let me start by um, introducing uh, Marta Sanz. Um, Marta is an award-winning Spanish novelist, poet, essayist, scholar, and is one of Spain's leading feminist writers. In the last two decades, she's written more than a dozen novels, four collections of poetry, in addition to her edited anthologies and frequent contributions to major Spanish media publications. Her fiction and poetry have been translated into English, a novel titled Showbiz, published by Hispa Books in 2018, and Italian and Hungarian. Marta's most recent novel, Small Red Women, was published last spring, just as the COVID pandemic was surging. Let me set the stage with a quick plot summary. It's the summer of 2008, and Paula Quiñones has arrived in a fictional agricultural village in southeast Spain called Azafran which is the Spanish word for saffron. Paula is 40-something, beautiful, idealistic, brilliant with numbers, and foolish in love. She suffered from polio as a child and walks with a limp. She's arrived as a volunteer in a government project to identify the remains of villagers executed by supporters of the dictator Francisco Franco during and after the Spanish Civil War. Paula realizes there must be an unidentified mass grave somewhere nearby, uh, and the villagers know but refuse to talk about it. And her investigation unleashes a wave of violence. So my first question, Marta, is why is the title Small Red Women in lowercase? Why small and why red? Bueno, muchísimas gracias por tu, por tu presentación, Katie. Eh, la, no, la novela se titula Pequeñas Mujeres Rojas y en la P de pequeñas decidí ponerla en, en, letra, en letra minúscula, yo creo que por, por dos razones que están interrelacionadas. La primera es que en España, al igual que en muchos otros países del mundo, creo que hay a veces una reacción muy conservadora respecto a cualquier intento de que el lenguaje sea inclusivo o respecto a cualquier intento de que el lenguaje sea juguetón. Y, ah. y, y la literatura creo que es el lugar precisamente donde podemos cometer travesuras. A través... <risa> let, me, let, me, let me capture that bit. So there are two reasons really yeah. for doing this. And the first one is that um, with the small, pequeñas, The um, idea is that it's important to, to play with literature. It's important to tell stories beyond stories by playing with the language. And the second reason? Bueno, eh, eh, está relacionada con la, con la primera, eh, porque en Pequeñas Mujeres Rojas, todas las mujeres que de alguna manera tienen una relación afectiva, tienen una relación sentimental, eh, con, con hombres no excesivamente recomendables acaban empequeñecidas. Las mujeres en la relación amorosa se convierten en el ser secundario, en el ser subalterno y se hacen pequeñitas, pequeñitas, como el personaje de Alicia en el País de las Maravillas. Entonces, en realidad, el atentado ortográfico es como un caligrama. Ah, so it's actually... Uh a feminist commentary on uh, uh, poor choices by women in relationships that choose to make themselves smaller in that relationship or allow themselves to be made smaller. So the title of the book uh, reflects that aspect of the story itself. Excelente. Pregunta dos. Um, So, Marta, this novel is based on real events in Spain. Um, it's a part of your crime fiction series featuring a gay male detective, Arturo Zarco. But the protagonist in this book is his ex-wife, um, Paula. So is this a crime novel? Is it a historical novel? Is it a feminist novel? Or can it be categorized? Who, what kind of reader would like to read this book? 
Esa pregunta es muy interesante y, y muy importante. Yo creo que es una novela que puede, que puede gustar a cualquier lector o a cualquier lectora que disfrute del de relieve de la lengua literaria. Que, que entienda que una novela puede ser política y puede ser, eh, sí, puede denunciar y ser testimonial eh, en función de su uso del lenguaje. Que el But any, que corre... any, reader, any reader who loves language play, plays of words, playing with language, playing with literature, will really like this novel because through that wordplay, you tell important stories. Continúa. Sí, 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 yo creo que, que en el tiempo de la prisa, en el tiempo de la velocidad, en el tiempo de los mensajes literare, literales, lo más eh, político acaba siendo lo poético. Oh, the, polit the things that are most political end up being poetic. That's a lovely, lovely thought. Um, question number three. We'll get to it. Okay, this story is narrated by three different voices, three distinct voices. The first one is by the lost children and dead women. Their ghosts and their ghostly omniscient voices arrive from somewhere underneath the dusty earth of the village and they speak to Paula. The second narrative voice is Paula herself in the form of letters, old fashioned letters. She writes and sends in the mail to her friend Luz in Madrid about her experiences searching for the missing dead buried in these mass graves and the voices she hears along the way. The third voice, the third narrator is her friend Luz who is writing about the events of that summer after the fact. So are any of these narrators reliable? Where does truth lie in this story? Yo creo que la verdad de la historia reside precisamente en su carácter coral en el hecho de que haya un mosaico de voces que nos permitan eh, asistir a diferentes puntos de vista. Ah, that's fantastic. So the truth in this story lies in hearing from many different voices, the chorus of different perspectives and uh, a way to understand what's real and what isn't real. Y hay una idea, Katie, que es importante que yo quisiera eh, subrayar y es que también son muy importantes las voces del pasado, porque las voces del pasado hacen de nosotros lo que somos en el presente. Y una historia como la nuestra, llena de cicatrices, eh, pues necesita recuperar esas voces, esas voces del pasado, para, si pretendemos que nuestra sociedad sea realmente democrática. So your story really underlines how important it is for readers to listen to voices from the past, because these voices from the past make us what we are today. And in a country like Spain, which still is healing from many wounds and has many scars from a uh, violent history, it's incredibly important to make sure lots of voices are heard. So that's fantastic, fabuloso. We are going to read now a little bit from this wonderful book. So uh, the book and the story opens with an introduction by this ghostly Greek chorus of the missing dead and their still undiscovered mass grave. In a scene of magical realism, these lost children and dead women and men observe Paula as she arrives and they question the motives of her mission. These are the opening lines in the novel. With our slingshots, excuse me, with our slingshots, please read slowly. We were from here, but also from elsewhere. We are the lost children and the dead women. God does not exist. We are proof of that. And down here, we always wear a smile. We know many things. We know that Paula's memories do not belong to this place. Then why has she come to this two-bit town? To do the dirty work? unearth the bones of the dead, and metaphorically speaking, revive us, only to reignite the fury of the bonfire and burn us again. Why has Paula come to delve into this pit, enlarging it, disturbing the atoms, and then disinfecting it with quicklime like a hired house cleaner or a garden who, gardener who only grows chrysanthemums? Why does she want to put names to these remains? Does Paula want to purge her own hidden guilt? like those who fatten a pig and then make sausages without washing their hands? Is she bored? 
What country is she from and her sin? What drives her to break her fingernails in the hard packed dirt and fill her lungs with dust as she tries to clean the jawbone of a man, probably a good man who lived just an instant on this earth and then consumed it forever. I can feel the tickle of her brush on my mandible. Who's consuming whom? Does the earth consume men, consume women, or do men, women, consume earth? We cannot answer that last question, and our ignorant, ignorance is so ironic. Marta, escuchamos en español. Sí, en inglés suena muy bien. Ahora... <laughs> It does sound pretty good. Yes. <laughs> Vamos al español. Con nuestros tirachinas. Lea despacio. Nosotros éramos oriundos y también éramos de otra parte. Somos los niños perdidos y las mujeres muertas. Dios no existe, damos fe de ello. Y nosotros aquí andamos siempre sonrientes. Sabemos un montón de cosas. Sabemos que los recuerdos de Paula no pertenecen a este lugar. ¿Por qué llega entonces a este pueblucho para ocuparse de las tareas sucias, desenterrar los huesos muertos, hablamos metafóricamente, reavivar los odios de una fogata en la que nos quemamos para regenerarnos de noche y al día siguiente volver a arder? ¿Por qué viene Paula a profundizar desde un átomo en la fosa, ensanchándola para después desinfectarla con cal viva como una jardinera que solo cultiva crisantemos o una limpiadora por horas? ¿Por qué quiere ponerles nombre a los despojos? ¿Quiere Paula purgar sus incógnitas culpas con los que cebaban al cerdo de San Antón y después lo embuchaban sin lavarse las manos? ¿Está aburrida? ¿Cuál es el país de Paula? ¿Y su pecado? ¿Qué filiación le lleva a estropearse las uñas contra el terrizo y a llenarse de arenilla los bronquios mientras intenta limpiar la quejada de un hombre, probablemente bueno, que habitó durante un instante esta tierra y después se la comió para siempre? Siento el cosquilleo de sus pincelitos en mi mandíbula. ¿Quién se comía a quién? La tierra al hombre, a las mujeres, o el hombre, las mujeres, a la tierra. Para esta última pregunta no tenemos contestación y esta ignorancia resulta tan irónica. Fabuloso, muy, muy, muy Gracias. bonito. Ok, second excerpt. In this section, Luz describes Paula arriving at her hotel in Azafran. Paula has chosen the oldest, least fashionable place in the town because she objects to the affectations of modern boutique hotels. It's just after lunch, siesta time, and the whole town is hot, shuttered, and deadly quiet. The hotel, an old house turned into a bar and some rooms to let, is closed at the front, but Paula searches for another way in. <clears throat> There was another door. Paula deduced that it must be the entrance to the owner's home. She looked for a bell, but didn't find one. And when she rapped on the door with her knuckles, it swung open on its own, revealing a porch and a dark hall leading to a semicircular archway with a large wooden door, which possibly concealed a living room. Trying to accustom her eyes to the dark, Paula squinted, just as she had when she tried to peek through the green blinds and started to feel her way like a cave explorer toward the crack that had magically opened up before her, an open sesame of legs, the slit, the great dark fig. As she moved forward, she started to feel like she was descending instead of walking along a level floor. It was an optical illusion, like a trompe l'oeil, but it made her dizzy and she clung to the walls with her fingernails. Paula often thought back to her honeymoon in Milan with Zarco, They'd eaten spicy gorgonzola and visited the childish trompe l'oeil in the church of Saint Satris, the Milanese saint with the fantastically opportune name. Fuck off, Zarco, Paula would have thought, cocking her ears to catch the sound of a voice in the dark, cool, faintly smelly passage. Everything seems smelly in this town, named for a fragrant spice, food dye, yellow rice. With each gulp of air, a fine layer of down filtered through her lungs. Hello? Hello? Paula whispered, failing to chase from her thoughts the macabre intuition of her own dismemberment. 
a mad image of someone approaching her from behind and putting a plastic bag over her head to subdue and asphyxiate her. Paula continued her advance along the hallway. Her rational response, hello, hello, was leaving her mouth dry and she searched for a glimmer of light. An open door to the left allowed her to glimpse a surprising kitchen with all the latest technology, microwave, oven, ceramic cooktop, washing machine, dishwasher, an island workstation with a range hood, white marble countertops, even a food processor. To her right, where a gas blast paned door was filtering rays of reddish light through thick blinds, Paula discovered a garden. She moved the blinds away from the glass, peeked behind the slats, and confirmed it was a flower garden filled with languid pink, white, and red roses, an image which this time triggered an acoustic illusion. She heard, off with her head. Paula touched the back of her neck and moved away from the window. She forced a smile as she reached the archway and the heavy wooden door, which she dared to push open. Excuse me? Abuloso. Ahora, Marta, en español. Había otra puerta. Paula dedujo que sería de la vivienda de los dueños. Buscó un timbre, pero no lo encontró. Y al llamar con los nudillos, la puerta se abrió sola, haciendo un zaguán y un pasillo casi sin luz que desembocaba en un arco de medio punto cegado por un gran portón de madera tras el que posiblemente se ocultaba una sala. Paula se entornó los párpados para acostumbrarse a la falta de luz, ya lo había hecho al intentar escudriñar a través de las, persiani de las persianillas verduzcas y anduvo como espeleóloga por la grieta que se le había abierto mágicamente. El sésamo abierto de patas, la hendidura, el gran higo oscuro, Mientras avanzaba, sintió que, en lugar de caminar sobre la línea horizontal de la tarima, estaba iniciando un descenso. Su percepción era ilusoria, pero el espejismo le producía vértigo y con las uñas casi se aferró a las paredes. Trampantojo. Paula a menudo recordaba el gorgonzola picante y su viaje de novios a Milán con Zarco, habían visitado el infantil trampantojo de la iglesia de San Sátiro, santo milanés con oportunísimo nombre de pila. Fuchizarco, pensaría Paula, aguzando el oído para tratar de percibir alguna voz entre la espesura de aquella oscuridad fresca que tampoco olía demasiado bien. Nada olía demasiado bien en este pueblo con nombre de especiero, colorante, arroz amarillo, con cada bocanada de aire se le depositaba en los bronquios una capa fina de plumón. Hola, hola, susurró sin poder quitarse de la cabeza el pálpito macabro de su propio descuartizamiento. La fantástica imagen de alguien que se le acercaba por detrás y le ponía una bolsa de plástico en la cabeza para provocarle un colapso y asfixiarla. Paula siguió avanzando. Su racionalidad le secaba la boca. Hola, hola, y buscaba un rescoldo de luz. Las puertas entornadas a su izquierda le permitieron identificar una cocina imprevisible con todos los avances tecnológicos. Microondas, horno, vitrocerámica, lavadora, lavaplatos, gran isla central y campana extractora de humos. Muebles lacados en blanco marfil. Incluso un robot de cocina. A su derecha, a través de una puertecita de cristal que tamizaba los rayos con espesos estertores rojizos, Paula descubrió el acceso a un jardín. La intrusa separó del cristal los estores, abrió una rendija y comprobó que el jardín era una rosaleda de lánguidas rosas rojas, rosas blancas y rojas que esta vez le hicieron experimentar una ilusión acústica. ¡Que le corten la cabeza! Paula se tocó el nacimiento del pelo a la altura del cogote y se apartó de la ventana. No paró de sonreír hasta llegar al gran arco de medio punto cegado por el portón que se atrevió a empujar. ¿Perdonen? Fabulous. Ok, thank you, Marta Sands, for your time. The novel, again, is Small Red Women, and it is available for publication in English. Muchas gracias de nuevo, Marta, por tu tiempo y generosidad.
Gracias a ti, Katie. Un placer enorme.